Hello and welcome uh, to our press briefing on the quarterly review. I'm joined this morning by Claudio Bar Borio, Head of the Monetary and Economic Department at the BIS, and Hyun Sung Shin, Head of Research and Economic Advisor at the BIS. Um, we will open shortly with remarks, but before that, maybe I can just go through some of the housekeeping. Um, this briefing is embargoed until Monday, the 19th of September at 3 p.m. Central European time. And obviously during the briefing, you can ask your questions. Please raise your hand, unmute your microphone. And if you wish to put on your camera, that would be very helpful so we can um, see you as you're asking your question. So with that, I hand over to Claudio. Well, uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Jill. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. The first section of the quarter review examines the period from 1st June to 12th September. During this period, markets danced to the tune of investors' evolving views about central banks' responses to persistently high inflation. A steady flow of news about inflation led investors to repeatedly shift expectations of the monetary policy stance, while the growth outlook deteriorated on the fallout from the war in Ukraine and further weakness in China. From mid-June to end July, equity and credit markets rallied on expectations that the path for policy rates would flatten after aggressive hikes. A seeming disconnect opened up between risky asset prices on the one hand and sovereign bond yields on the other as a surprisingly large hike by the Fed triggered a rather paradoxical easing of financial conditions. Then, in August, risky asset prices reversed direction and yields climbed amid a more forceful policy response to fight inflation. The recent sell-off in markets, which occurred after the review period, has confirmed that investors have been rather sanguine over the past three months about the economic challenges and how they would be resolved. They have now woken up to the fact that policymakers are engaged in a tough battle against tenacious inflation at a time of elevated financial vulnerabilities. The US dollar rose to multi-decade highs during the review period. It reached the highest level against the euro and the yen in more than two decades due to faster monetary tightening in the United States as well as the European energy crisis. Market developments diverged across emerging market economies. They too were often um, shaped by the policy response to inflation. The currencies of EMEs with high and entrenched inflation depreciated steadily against the US dollar. Having started the hiking cycle early on, some Latin American countries saw sovereign yields considerably higher and those in Asia, at least partly as a result of favorable interest rate differentials, some of the major Latin American currencies stopped depreciating against the US dollar in the later part of the period. I will now give the floor to Hyun, who will, take, who will talk about recent developments in commodity markets and the special features in the edition of the quarter. Thank you, Claudio. Um, as, uh, as Claudio mentioned, commodity markets have been buffeted by shocks, both real and financial. In terms of prices, uh, we have a mixed picture. Many commodity prices have declined from peaks reached after the outbreak of the Ukraine war. But natural gas prices have soared, particularly in Europe. In turn, liquidity stresses in the European electricity market serve as a salutary reminder of the challenges of shielding the real economy from financial shocks. Commodities are the topic of one special feature in the September quarterly. The other four features are on indicators of market conditions, borrower vulnerabilities, the retreat of global banking, and sovereign sustainable bonds. Let me take these in turn. Fernando Avalos and Wen Chan Huang argue that a straight substitution of Russian oil output in global markets, if needed, would be difficult to achieve. Substitution without demand reduction would result in higher prices with spillover effects on crops used in biofuels. 
In addition, the authors find that high natural gas prices may raise electricity prices further, hurting industrial production down the road. Iñaki Aldosoro, Peter Hurdle, and Sonia Ju develop a suite of new market conditions indicators for three key segments uh, of the financial markets, foreign exchange, US dollar money markets, and the US treasury market. The indicators successfully identify past, uh, past stress episodes. Uh, and then the authors conduct more detailed studies and find that signals of market fragility may help to anticipate stress several months, uh, several months in advance. Ryan Banerjee, Francesco Franceschi, and Stefan Riederer argue that granular data on borrower vulnerabilities add useful information for financial stability analysis. In particular, borrower level repayment capacity helps to predict credit losses in the household and corporate sectors that aggregate measures would have missed. John Caparuso and Brian Hardy document two shifts in the funding sources for local banking systems. The first is a shift from cross-border to local funding, which typically enhances stability. The second shift has occurred within the cross-border funding um, category and is from inter-office to other less stable sources. These changes likely reflect the consequences of a sustained retreat um, from global banking since its heyday uh, in the early 2000s. Gong Cheng, Torsten Ehlers, and Frank Packer focus on the fast-growing market for sustainable bonds. Sovereigns uh, arrived late in this market where, sustainably, where sustainability-linked bonds are a new instrument. If they come with penalties for non-compliance that align issuers' incentives with the goal of carbon emission reductions, sustainability-linked bonds could help sovereigns increase their presence in this market segment. Okay. We now go to questions. So if you could raise your hands, turn on your cameras, uh, it would be helpful to you, or propose your question in the chat. I'm keeping an eye here. Thanks. Great, so just waiting a moment. I see Johanna Trek from Politico. Johanna, if you want to answer your question, ask your question. Unmute your mic, please. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering whether you had any uh, views on the, the, the exchange rate developments and whether those are a concern to you, um, this exceptional strength of the dollar. So, Hyun, please. Yes, um, thanks, Johanna, for that question. Uh, you know, as, you, as, as Claudia mentioned, uh, the dollar um, has strengthened to, to multi decade highs, I guess, uh, you know, against the major. Uh, currencies, um, as well as for some emerging currencies. But I think it's, um, uh, it is notable that uh, uh, emerging market economies have actually uh, fared quite well so far, especially those economies uh, that are commodity producers. Um, but I think the, um, the main theme is the, is the diversity in the outcomes across Economies, we we do see uh, you know large range of different outcomes. Um, economies in Asia, uh, you know, have seen their exchange rates depreciate, and that includes um, you know both Japan and China, uh, as well as other other economies in the region. Um, I suppose you know the the. Uh, the issue going forward would be um, the different stances of monetary policy and how that would affect very large uh, exchange rate movements. I, you know, I think we have seen um, these big uh, exchange rate uh, movements due in large part to the differing monetary policy stances across uh, economies. But we are seeing uh, those monetary policy stances, uh, you know, coming together now as. Uh, as they tackle inflation. Um, Claude, did you have uh, some further points to add? Uh, uh, maybe just to, to add uh, to what Hume said, um, we know where the channels are. Um, first of all, a, a stronger dollar, dollar 
means that uh, by uh, generating depreciation pressure uh, on, other, uh, on other currencies, we'll tend to put upward pressure on, on inflation in other economies. This is something that has historically been the case. It's nothing new, and, but that does mean that uh, there will be more need elsewhere to, to tighten monetary policy. The other effect, which has been amply studied actually by, by Hume, is the impact on financial conditions. A stronger dollar tends to tighten through the financial side, through balance sheets, the financial conditions elsewhere in the world, particularly in emerging market economies, which are more vulnerable to this phenomenon. Having said that, there are big differences among emerging market economies. And through this could uh, put some further pressure uh, to tighten monetary policy to prevent a big depreciation and could also induce as an additional tool uh, foreign currency intervention as it has already in a number of countries. Thank you very much, Claudio. The next question comes from Etienne Gutz from Les Echo. Etienne, please. Yes, hi, uh, thank you. Um, uh, do you have any recommendation to address the margin and the volatility uh, issue in uh, commodity markets? Thank you. John, please. Yeah. Yes, Etienne, let me, let me take that question. Um, and I would uh, you know, highly recommend that you, you take a look at the special feature uh, that, I, that I just introduced. Um, and we can put you in touch with the authors as well. Uh, so as I said in my opening remarks, um, the, the price picture has, um, has changed uh, you know, over, over the months following the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. Uh, you know, we saw initially a very sharp spike in, in commodity prices uh, in late February, March. Uh, those prices have come down um, in, in some segments, uh, but you're right that uh, in natural gas and in electricity, we've seen uh, you know, much more um, you know, much larger movements, both uh, on the way up and on the way down. Um, even in gas and uh, electricity, the prices have come down quite a lot since their peaks earlier in the summer. Um, so I think it's roughly you know, 10 times pre-pandemic levels in, in gas, in natural gas, and even, uh, well, I think around nine, 10 times, I think, um, in, in the case of electricity. What that suggests is that you know, there are uh, forces working in these markets that uh, not only reflect the, the underlying economic fundamentals, but also there are financial forces that tend to amplify you know, these kind of shocks. And um, as you say, the margining practices um, in, in commodity markets uh, have again uh, you know, come under um, you know, greater uh, scrutiny in the light of uh, you know, the events. Um, to some extent, the, uh, and as you know, uh, the authorities have unveiled various measures, you know, uh, liquidity support measures to sustain, the energy, uh, to sustain energy firms um, through stress that are purely financial. Uh, so if it's more about um, the, uh, you know, the maturity mismatch uh, rather than the underlying cash flows, uh, for example, if you've hedged by um, you know, selling your output, um, uh, you know, forward, but then the margin calls come, uh, you know, on a daily basis. That would be a, an example of a maturity mismatch. Um, I mean, those cases, it's, a, you know, it's about the liquidity rather than the solvency uh, because those cash flows, you know, will be, will be coming eventually. Um, and for these reasons, um, as you've seen, authorities have rolled out various schemes. Um, they you know, typically involve the commercial banking sector uh, together with uh, some type of guarantee um, uh, that, is, uh, that is provided by the government. Um, I guess you know, there's also an issue about uh, margining practices during you know, normal times as well in that uh, the, the, uh, the impact of these margin calls um, you know, could be larger if the day-to-day -day normal uh, margining levels are actually very thin because then the increase in margins you know, would be that much larger in proportional terms. So uh, I think there are, different, uh, there are definitely lessons here for margining practices um, during normal times. Uh, but there are also, of course, uh, lessons in how to deal with this, uh, to, to remedy these uh, liquidity stresses uh, you know, during, 
uh, stress types as well. Thanks very much. We go to the next question, which is from Francesco Ninfole from Milano Finanza. Francesco. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask you um, if you expect that uh, central banks tightening will lead to a recession in US and Eurozone. And uh, secondly, when do you expect that the central banks will have to stop this tightening to consider the economic slowdown? Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco. I'll hand over to, to Claudio. Um, well, this is, of course, uh, the one billion or three billion or whatever mi number of billions you want dollar question. Um, we have been um, considering this in some detail. It's uh, elaborated in the annual economic report in which we also make a number of possible simulations about how the economies might react to increases in interest rates. Um, we, we know that the path is quite narrow, um, given that for the first time we're seeing, uh, first time in the, uh, since the war, uh, but possibly even going further back, we're seeing uh, the conjunction of a tightening of monetary policy in order to deal with uh, inflation, while uh, at the same time we are seeing uh, financial vulnerabilities around the world, in particular as a result of very high levels of uh, debt, private and public, as well as uh, rich asset prices, and, and notably in the, in the property real estate um, sector. Um, there are some uh, lessons from uh, history uh, that again are uh, analyzed in the annual economic report in terms of the kinds of factors that at least historically have been associated with hard uh, and soft landings. Things like high vacancy rates, for example, which uh, are the case in a number of, of economies, uh, tend to be followed by relatively more uh, s softer landings. Um, on the other hand, uh, high levels of debt tend to be associated with uh, harder landings. But what is, from the point of view of policy, and this is important, another uh, lesson or at least indication that we get from past episodes is that front loading tends to be, uh, tends to reduce the likelihood of uh, a hard landing. So this clearly suggests that it is important for central banks to uh, focus on inflation, to uh, do the job. Um, and uh, of course we know that this will unfortunately have um, short-term costs because that is the way that monetary policy operates. It operates by cutting aggregate demand, constraining aggregate demand so as to re-equilibrate the uh, demand with the uh, capacity of the economy to, to produce. Um, but what we also know from, from history is that if you wait and if you don't deal with the problems and if you allow inflation to become entrenched, this will raise the costs further down the road. So you, uh, you have to sort of uh, weigh these two factors. And as I mentioned, it is important to act in a timely and forceful way. Again, a message that we elaborate on in the annual economic report. Okay, we have a question in the chat, and I actually can't see who it's from, so, um, but I, uh, the question is, um, we'll just get that detail in a moment. In, in the quarterly, you said the, the investment-grade corporate bonds indices have grown riskier over time. Do you see any systemic financial risk coming from the increase of the share of bonds rated triple B? Uh, this, uh, this phenomenon is well known. Uh, we elaborate on it in the, in the box. It is something to which we and others have drawn attention for quite some time. The, the uh, aspect, the specific problem with a triple, a triple B, with the triple B segment, is that many investors are constrained to invest in the, uh, in the investment grade category. Triple B is at the bottom of that category, so if you get further downgrades, you can have some cliff effects with uh, investors having to sell off their assets, either because you have uh, a downgrade or because they're expecting the downgrade to, to happen. This is clearly uh, another source of, uh, another vulnerability in the, out there in financial markets. Um, 
something that we also mention, although we don't elaborate a lot, is the fact that there are rather opaque corners uh, in, in financial markets uh, in the cre in credit space that I think need to be watched and monitored closely, and one of them is the private credit market, which we had discussed in more detail on, um, uh, on, another, on another occasion. The other thing to bear in mind is that although equity markets have adjusted quite a lot uh, in the most recent sell-offs, credit markets have not adjusted to, to the same extent. And uh, again, we have another box that considers this more closely in the case of Europe, but this is a more general statement. Great, thank you. And the question was from Pier Giorgio Sandri, so thank you very much. I see a hand raised from, uh, I think it's Mark Jones, if I'm correct, from Reuters. So Mark, if you want to unmute, please. Hi, can you hear you me? You can, yeah. Go ahead. Excellent. Um, so uh, just kind of going back to that question you asked about recession risks, and you were saying that it's, the path is quite narrow. I think last time we spoke, you know, there was the view that it can still be avoided. So is is really what you're saying here is that the risk of recessions is probably higher than it was last time we spoke. I mean, can we just be honest about that and, and say that? Um, I also have a quick question about one of the special boxes, and it's on the sustainable bonds. Um, one of the kind of uh, conclusions from that is about the, the penalties that you put on sovereign governments if they don't hit the targets that are put in these sustainable bonds. Um, so can you give us a kind of feel for how large those penalties should be to make sure that, you know, these have got credibility and people do stick to those targets? Okay, maybe suggest we take it in two parts. Maybe the first part, Claudio. Um, well, uh, since uh, we last spoke, uh, gr growth forecasts have been revised downwards and inflation forecasts have been revised upwards. So I, I think that you've got the answer there. Uh, clearly, if there was a risk of a recession before, the risk has, has increased. Um, obviously, the extent to which it has increased depends on, um, on the countries. Um, and the countries, for example, that are more vulnerable uh, to, uh, to the energy problems are clearly also more vulnerable to the risk of a recession. Then the second part, I think. Yeah, Mark, let me, let me take that question on the sustainable bonds. Um, so this is a new um, asset class. It's, uh, it's just getting going. Um, it's, uh, you know, the spirit of this is uh, in some ways quite similar to um, the kind of contingencies that are embedded in ideas like GDP-linked bonds uh, that actually is tied to, to uh, the ability to repay. But it's actually... Um, uh, it has this nice feature that the incentives are actually aligned in a very, um, in a very favorable way in that uh, the, um, the sustainability targets uh, are things that the, are benchmarks that the sovereign itself uh, you know, chooses. Uh, and to the extent that it will actually um, uh, you know, meet those targets, uh, it, it can actually, uh, you know, reduce the, um, you know, the payment. How we calibrate that, I think, will will uh, depend on um, how ambitious the targets are and uh, the time horizon. Uh, and in fact, we have uh, uh, one of the authors here, uh, so we can definitely um, get in touch with you if you need some sort of further details on on the specifics of the market. Uh, but in broad terms, the idea is to inject some contingencies that actually align uh, the incentives of the sovereign um, to, to the sustainability targets. Thank you very much, Jan. I'm just looking now to see if there are other hands raised. Okay. So we'll just wait a moment just to see if anything is coming in as well by message. We just take a pause. I see. Is that Mark's hand again? Uh, let me just check. Yeah, Mark Jones, are you? Have you raised a hand again, or is it an old yeah. hand? Okay. No, no. Just, um, sorry about that. Just a quick follow-up question. No as well. problem. Um, 
And you also mentioned about the, the property prices still being elevated. And obviously with interest rates going up so rapidly at the moment, is there a, a real um, potential here for some property prices to break out? Claudia? Uh, yes, in, in the annual report, I, I would uh, strongly uh, suggest that you do look at the annual economic report because we have simulations. And those simulations clearly indicate that uh, higher interest rates will bring uh, property prices down. Um, th this is a uh, simple maths. If, if prices are, if the markets are rather frothy and if you raise interest rates, uh, prices will adjust. And this, again, is part of the a way in which monetary policy operates by restricting credit, by uh, in general restricting financial conditions, and real estate markets are, are an important part of the of the overall story. Where is it more likely, or where are uh, property prices more vulnerable in general in countries in which they have been uh, growing faster, and of course in in countries where a lot of the credit is in the form of flexible uh, rates, uh, variable rates, because that does mean that the short term, uh, the impact on cash flows is, is front loaded and stronger. Great, thank you very much. I think there's a table in the EOR on that as well. And the next question comes from Francis Schwarzkopf from Bloomberg. Francis, please unmute. Okay, the question is in the chat. Uh -huh. Okay, I see it now, yeah, okay. So how can penalties on SLBs be toughened to serve as an appropriate incentive when weak ones would seem to be sovereign's advantage? I tried the question sovereign again, bond. just read it out yeah. again. So how can- about ha sovereign bond. Yeah, sovereign, yeah. 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 sovereign. Be toughened to serve as an appropriate incentive when weak ones would seem to be sovereign's advantage? You might pause and reflect on that one just for a moment. So this is about the, so Francis, this is about the sovereign bond? S sustainability. Link. The sustainability yeah. link bond. Yeah, yeah. SLBs. Yeah. 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 So the, the um, you know, one, one issue that uh, often arises, so let me, uh, you know, address um, uh, this and, um, uh, you know, we can, we can put you in touch with the authors on this, uh, Francis. In the case of GDP linked bonds, um, you know, there are, so, you know, the, uh, you know, GDP is a, uh, is a number that is um, produced uh, by the National Statistical Office. And you know, if you were to tie that kind of number to, uh, you know, the actual, uh, you know, fiscal, you know, payouts, uh, then, you know, then it could be that the indicators would be, you know, would be influenced. Uh, you know, they they may be subject to, um, uh, you know, subject to, you know, different interpretations, uh, and and the numbers may not be, you know, exactly uh, the kind of very reliable signal that uh, you had initially uh, picked. In the case of uh, sovereign, um, the uh, the indicators will be global, um, and you know, they be. Uh, also something which is subject to, you know, much greater scrutiny from the outside. I think here, of course, uh, whatever is promised has to be, you know, well within the, uh, the scope of the country itself to, to deliver. So, you know, there would be uh, certainly a, um, a discount for any kind of uh, promise that is, uh, that is unrealistic, yeah. Um, but let me, let me put you in touch with the authors on this. I think Claudia, you wanted to come in on that, did you? Yeah, you? just to complement what uh, Hune is saying. Um, as uh, as you have surely read in the, in the piece, the, the issue of sovereign uh, of sustainability link bonds is precisely designed to deal with the fungibility of um, the use of the proceeds uh, by sovereigns, um, and it is in f it is in fact a rather clever, I would say, way of uh, doing so, and to link it to the overall objectives of uh, climate change, um, well, dealing with climate change. Um, you, uh, as you and your colleagues uh, mentioned before, the, uh, uh, the credibility of the penalties is a key issue, uh, wh which has to be addressed, and it is not that easy to address. But at the same time, I think we should 
bear in mind that, uh, as the special feature highlights, that the benefits of uh, issuing, sovereign issuance of these bonds go way beyond the impact on the sovereign itself. And they have uh, been a catalyst for private sector issuance as, as the government have uh, subjected themselves to voluntarily to, to tougher standards that then have been extended to the, to the private sector. And this has been particularly ev in evidence in emerging market economies. Thank you very much, Claudio. So taking a pause again to see if there are any raised hands. Just give a moment. Just give another moment in case there's anybody, I can't see anybody coming in. Francis, did you have a follow-up question? I don't know if we had a follow-up question from Francis. I don't think so. Okay. I think we are we're, we're finished then, just to check. Okay, last last chance, last moment. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, um, for your time today and for accommodating the, the change as well today in, in the timing. A reminder that the embargo lifts Monday, 3 o'clock Central European time, uh, which is the 19th of September. And we wish you all very well and are happy to take any follow-up questions or queries. Thank you and take care. Goodbye. <laughs>